How do you voice your concern about something? What happens when something happens that you do not like, that you do not agree with, that you want to speak out against? How can you get that message across and not only say it, but get that behavior to stop? To get that thing that bothers you to stop bothering you. Hey everybody, I'm Daniel, the psychology student who's talking to you about the things that hopefully someone should have talked to you already about. We learn so many things in school, but a lot of the things we miss out on are basic psychological tips, whether it's our own mental health or the societal, the social aspect of it. Today we're going to talk about what happens when there's something that makes you upset, there's something that makes you angry, something that you're not okay with, that you want to speak out on. Now there's several different problems that this takes. The first problem is the people who are so humble and, and say, look, I shouldn't complain. It's wrong to complain. It would be impolite to complain. So then they keep it in. The problem with that is it gets built up and it turns into resentment over time. So then when someone does something, the chances of you lashing out in an inappropriate manner are extremely high. Why? Because when we don't verbalize our concerns, our contentment, our resentment, it doesn't go away. Like we don't just forget things, right? When people say, look, um, this family member of yours passed away, just stop thinking about it. And if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away. There used to be a saying in counseling that said, if someone comes into a counselor's office, never talk about suicide ideation. Suicide ideation being having thoughts of taking your own life. Why? The thought was, if we start to talk about this, then the client will start to think more about taking their own life and we don't want to add to that. So we're just not going to talk about it. Well, the problem here is just because we don't verbalize something, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, doesn't mean that a person won't think about it. So the problem becomes if you're either you fall into category A where something happens that make you upset and you don't talk about it for whatever reason, maybe you say it's not a big deal, maybe you say you know they're having a bad day, for whatever justification, over time when those get built up, it is completely natural and normal for you to get fed up. That's why it's so common to have the scenario of the guy who let's say goes to work, his supervisor's a jerk, his colleague is no good, he gets a parking ticket, but he remains relatively cool. And then he comes home and his girlfriend's like, hey, um, you know, you never clean the place up. Could you do it tonight? He freaking loses his mind. He flips out. Why? Well, it's based on several things, but one of the biggest ones is carrying all that, all that weight. I like to imagine it like rocks in a backpack that when someone else adds the final pebble, it's just too much and it gives way. Now, the second category of people is this. We understand the reason for critiquing, the reason for complaining, the reason for talking about something that makes us upset in order to change a behavior. The problem is the method in which we go about doing such. Let me give you an example of something that you've definitely heard in your own life, you've definitely seen in TV shows. Saying such as, why do you never clean up the place? Why is it always like this with you? You always do this or you never do this. What's wrong with you? How stupid can a person be? Are you actually that dumb to do blank? Now folks, what is the common theme there? So the big ones that I try to exaggerate is always and never. Be very careful of saying stuff like that, right? Because when you say you always do this, we're creeping into a different territory. We're creeping from this is a behavior that I don't like to I'm attaching something to your identity as a person. Rather than me saying, hey dude, um, sometimes you can be unpunctual is different than saying you're an unpunctual person, right? Hey, you can lash out sometimes. You have your moments of anger is different than saying you are an angry person. I talked about this years ago, folks, before COVID even. I said the first one, when you address a behavior, it re-emphasizes that I'm not attacking you, that me and you are on a team and we're talking about something externally. But the moment I go, instead of saying, you have angry moments sometimes, I say, you're an angry person. You're an idiot. You're a lazy person. What I've just done is I've portrayed this image that this behavior is a reflection of your character as a person. You walk into a bar, you throw a punch at someone. Martial arts experience or not, the person's natural reaction is their hands are going to come up. They're going to physically defend themselves. So why are we surprised that when we verbally attack someone, you never do the dishes? Why are you so lazy? You're so dumb. John could have done this a lot better than you could. Why are we surprised that when we verbally attack someone, they verbally defend themselves? 
Why? Because I just attacked your character. I attacked an integral part of your being. Right? So the problem that I find is either people find things that bother them, but they don't speak up, or they want to speak up, but they, they don't do it in a way that is self-serving. They don't do it in a way that is beneficial to them and to the original person. Like, here's, here's one of these things, right? You know, John, why do you leave the faucet running? When you go to the bathroom, when you're done, the water's just running. You do not turn it off. Why don't you do that? Now, play with me here. The question says why, right? So it ponders that there's an actual reason why John leaves the, the faucet on, why he doesn't turn off the tap when he's done using the bathroom. What's happening most likely, unless there's this eloquent reason, he forgot. But the, the sheer asking of this question, and it's not just the question, it's the tone. Like, why do you leave the faucet running? Give me an example. Why? Why do you do that? As if John's going to reply and be like, oh, well, I really like to hear the sound of the water running as I leave the bathroom. Right? The more probable answer is, look, I forgot. And then maybe she says something like, well, you shouldn't forget, or you're always forgetting, or how can someone be so stupid? And what's that going to do to John? John is sitting there going, okay, this lady is finding a problem with this behavior. I don't find it a problem. So what is he going to do nine times out of ten? He does the shoulder shrug. He looks away. He goes, Psh, what are you talking about? Yeah, so what? Who cares? Whatever. So what? I can't believe you're so sensitive about this stuff, right? And you have to understand that it's so complex because they're both interacting with one another, which creates that sort of a response. And guess what? Now she gets madder because in her head, she's going, I take this seriously. Why don't you take this seriously? This is just like last week when you didn't take me seriously and the week before then. You don't care about me. You don't care about my feelings. And all of a sudden... An argument from nothing turns into something, right? You hear the classic joke about, you know, couples who've been together for a long time talking about arguing about these miscellaneous things, you know, tomato, tomato. And the reason is that it's so complex and there's so many factors involved from how did the argument begin? What was the tone of voice like? Um, what's, there are two big things, folks, when you think about emotion, I want you to keep in mind. One is emotion regulation, which is your ability to regulate your emotions. Regulate essentially means... Look, you can feel angry. Someone can make you feel extremely angry. But how you respond is completely up to you. And the better you can regulate your emotion, the less likely you are to give in to emotional impulses. You're walking along the street, someone yells something harmful towards you. Someone with low emotional regulation might get really upset. They might get flustered. They might get angry. They might yell back. They might say something. And it's not, don't get it confused with bravery. Because it's not like, oh, well, I'm brave. I would say something back. Folks, there's a difference between standing up for yourself when you consciously choose to versus involuntarily doing something, right? They're totally different things. It's one thing if you take a deep breath and you go, I want to put him in his place versus you just see red and you're not able to think logically. That would be associated with poor emotional regulation, meaning when you have emotions, your ability to take a step back and be careful how you act on said emotions uh, is extremely important in how you interact with other people. Another big word is also emotional sensitivity, meaning, and a big part of this is genetic. For example, something happens to the both of us, we both get upset. But for whatever reason, you get way more upset than I do at this situation, or vice versa. I get way more upset than you do. So for whatever genetic reason this is, some people are biologically wired to be a little bit more emotionally intense to have a little bit stronger emotional impulses than other people. Now, these can be worked on. You can become aware of them and that stuff. But just know that we don't all start equally from like an emotional intensity or emotion regulation model. Not to mention there's so many other factors, societal factors, uh, parental influences, community influences, which impact that stuff. So there's a lot of problems when we want to voice our concerns. The first one was how do we do it? Something makes you upset, right? The first thing that you do is you have to understand yourself before you open your mouth. So you sit there and you go, okay, this is making me upset. Why? Let me give you another example. 
Um, so we talked about why it's bad to say you always do this or you never do this or what they would call in social psychology, kitchen sinking. You know, well, now you leave the faucet on the sink and two days ago you didn't wash the dishes and a week ago you didn't do this. So what's beginning to happen is they start throwing a bunch of behaviors together which appear to have a theme so they can tie it back to your character and go, uh, you're, a, you're a selfish person who doesn't care about the needs of other people. You hear that. It's not a very kind thing to hear. You get upset, so you respond back. And sometimes what we do is, oh, well, me? Well, three weeks ago, you did this, and then you did that. So we just start pointing out each other's problems. And it turns into this whole mess when, folks, it was avoidable. Let me give you a perfect example of an of a inorganic, meaning a not natural, it's mechanical, but you understand how it could be, okay? Imagine this. We just talked about the bad version. Let me give you a good version. Bill and Sarah come back from a party. Sarah looks at Bill and says, Bill, I'm very upset with you. Actually, she doesn't even say anything at first. Maybe she... she appears upset. Maybe she doesn't talk as much. Maybe it's a quiet car ride home. And eventually she, she says, Bill, I'm very upset with you. And Bill, to a surprise, goes, why? Why, Sarah? She goes, you were flirting at that party with other women in front of me just now. And Bill goes, I was not flirting. And Sarah goes, oh, in her head, she goes, he might not actually be aware of what he's doing that's bothering me. Bill might not be able to read my mind. Even though it seems crystal clear to me, it might not be crystal clear to him. And what a lot of people would do in this situation is they would get even more mad because they'd say, well, it's obvious to me. Why is it not obvious to you? Or you should know why I'm angry. I shouldn't even have to tell you. But Sarah, being in this perfect example, goes, Bill, when I see you making these jokes with these girls, you don't joke like that with any of your other friends, only with women. And I've noticed. And Bill just sits there and he listens. And she goes, look, when I see you joke like that, I feel upset. So two really big things I want you to underline in that sentence. I. The first thing is when I see you joke, meaning there's a subjectivity. This way he can't deny it. Do you understand what I mean? Because she's going, look, this is what it looks like to me. It, it's less at, uh, attacking than saying, this is what you're doing, right? Look, Bill, when I see you flirting with other girls, when I see what appears to be you flirting with other girls, it makes me feel uncomfortable, right? And then maybe Bill wants to help get to the bottom of this. And he goes, well, Sarah, what do you mean? What, what does flirting look like to you? And she goes, well, you make these sorts of jokes and they have a sexual innuendo. And sometimes you even, you even touch the girls, like afterwards, like just on the shoulder. And I notice you don't do this with anyone else. And Bill kind of sits there and he goes, okay, I engage in this behavior. This behavior is making you upset. What do we need to do to prevent you from getting upset again? And logically, there's a number of things. I'm going to do what I keep doing. Sarah, you just look the other way right? Another one is, Bill, you're just not allowed to talk to another female at a party. That could be another solution. But maybe a more practical one is this. Bill goes, look, Sarah, I hear what you're saying. The next time we go to a party and we're talking, let's have a signal, a look, a tap on the shoulder and catch me when I'm doing it. Because clearly I wasn't aware of it. I didn't think that's what I was doing. But regardless, whatever I'm doing is making you feel uncomfortable. Thank you for telling me. Let's work on this together so we can move forward. Okay? But I'm going to need your help and your patience. Let's give it a try. And in a perfect world, they're at a party. Bill starts to engage in his flirting. Sarah gives him a nod or a tap on the shoulder. And Bill, it takes him a couple of seconds to come out of party mode and go, Oh, oh okay, I was just engaging in that. So he's going to be more aware about the jokes and about how he's talking. And it should modify his behavior. On the car ride home from the second party, now they talk. And Bill goes, hey, what did you think about tonight? And Sarah goes, oh, well, you slipped up, but, but it was a lot better than the previous night. Right? And that's how you start to move forward. 
Now, I may have lost some of you and go, Daniel, I don't give two zips about Bill and Sarah or any other problems, but you have to understand how applicable that idea is to you and your employer, to you and your sibling, you and your child, you and your parents, you and your coworker. Right? The problem is what I just said, it was very artificial. It was, it was hypothetical. It was created in this perfect light. In reality, there's a lot more emotions. You're so emotionally angry and there's so many misconceptions about how an argument is supposed to be solved. And there's so many complex factors such as modeling. Well, let's say if you're a young boy and how your parents ended an argument was by yelling at each other. And then the person who yelled the loudest, well, that's who won the argument. Right? Or the moment someone accused you of something, you have to be defensive and you have to accuse them. And you gotta have a back and forth until you make her cry and then you win. A lot of it impacts it. But th there's a couple of principles that if we keep in mind, it's gonna make our lives a lot easier. One, the subjectivity of reality. What you see is gonna be different than what I see. And I, it's okay. That's okay. And what I see is gonna be different than what you see. Okay, fair enough, right? Number two, be careful when making accusations. If there is something that you do that I do not like, I'm gonna think twice before I pin it to your character. Mustafa, why are you so lazy? Versus, hey Mustafa, do you have a moment? I notice when you come home, sometimes you just throw your jacket around on the ground and then you, you walk by. Um, that's kind of a lazy thing to do. And you're not a lazy person. So tell me about that. And maybe Mustafa goes, uh, yeah, man, I don't really think, I don't really care where the jacket goes and I throw it on the ground. To which maybe I'd reply, with, well, look, man, um, we're living here, we're roommates. And I would really appreciate it if we all, whenever we came in, we all hung up our jackets. Like, that'd be great. Visually, that'd be awesome if we invite friends over. It'd be great. The place can remain clean and everybody will benefit. Again, easier said than done, but you have to understand that in the, in the long run, it's a lot more complex and it's a lot trickier. Why? For the very reasons I said earlier. Someone could say things like you always. Someone could say things like you never. People could oftentimes, if you're in a situation like that, they could say, look, uh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal to me, so it's not a big deal. So it shouldn't be a big deal for you either. You're being too sensitive. And that's where the problem that you come into where you've got all these other factors. Again, how are you going about telling them? What is the tone that you're using? Are you accusing them of something? Then how do they respond? How are they feeling when you talk to them? What if they're in a bad mood? What if they haven't had lunch? What if they're in a great mood? What if they're in a rush and they're like, yeah, 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 whatever you say. And then they go the next day and then they repeat the thing that you told them not to repeat. Then what do you do? So I want you to understand that everything I've talked about so far, there's so many factors involved. And to say, oh, just follow, you know, Daniel's this formula, it's going to go perfectly well. Unfortunately, that's not true. But what we can recognize is if we can just be aware of a couple of things on our end, it can help us better regulate our emotions when someone accuses us. You'll, you'll think, oh, okay, I'm starting to feel a little defensive. I, I have an inclination to raise my voice. My heart rate is beating a little bit faster. Like there's something I want to say in a bad tone. Okay, let me just relax, take a breath, just sit for Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just listen. Don't say anything. Just nod your head. Okay. And if we can do that, even little by little, then we can start, hopefully, moving in a place of problem solving and of voicing our critiques that is a lot more beneficial to all parties involved. I hope you enjoyed this episode, folks. This has been another one. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe.